In fact, um, I might actually want you to see something before I switch over to that other camera. So let me see if I can. Ooh. I can do that. I'm going to connect my regular camera. Okay. So let me go back to here now and press. All right, is it working now? Yeah, all right. So um, what I wanted to do was do a problem with you, a circular motion problem, but I wanted you to see it in action first. This is one that uh, is sometimes shows up on the EP exam. Usually if it does, it's on a free response question. So what we, what we have with this simple little demonstration is a string, um, and then I have a little plastic tube here that's only you know four or five inches long that I get to hold on to. In fact, I could probably step a little closer. In a moment, pin myself to the screen. So I can at least see what you see. Okay, so um, yeah, there's a rubber stopper tied to one end here. Um, then there's a string, and the string actually, from the rubber stopper end, um, the string. Oops. Upside down. So the string actually goes straight through this little hole uh, here in this little plastic tube. Like a straw, kind of a harder though. And then it just ties all the way goes down to the other end, and that's where you have your uh, rubber stopper. So essentially, what I can do is when I swing this over my head like this, I have this now in circular motion. Of course, the thing that's on top, which is the rubber stopper, the, cent the center of that circle. You lost one of the. The, middle. Uh, the center is this, this plastic piece that I'm holding. And I can actually, therefore, adjust the radius. Since when I'm swinging it, the radius of the circular path goes from my thumb area where I'm holding it to the end, the end point. And that's adjustable. So I can swing it. I can tighten it up by pulling, by pulling on the bottom part. Of course, I can shorten that and make that a much smaller radius. Or I can extend it by allowing the, my bottom hand to go up. And now I have a really wide radius. So it's adjustable. Um, the idea for this simple demonstration is usually, I'm going to actually turn this a little more to stay away from that rope, to show students that it's possible. Because while this swings, while this swings around like this, you might think, which way am I pulling? My, or even if you don't want to think about my hand, which way is the rope pulling as I swing this? If I were to stop it at some position along that path, like let's say here, which way is the rope pulling on this piece of metal that's hanging on the end? Well, that's a centripetal force, right? Because anything that's going in some circular path must receive some inward force in order for it to stay on that circular path. It does have a weight force, which is down, but that's not a centripetal force because that's not pointing towards the center of the circle, which is where my fingers are. So it's the tension. It's the tension in this rope or the string that's tied to this um, ends up pulling on this piece of mass always inwards. If it was behind my head, 
then the rope is pulling still inward towards my hands. If it was on the other side over here, over here, then the tension is now still in the direction towards, think of that vector always pointing towards the center like this, my fingers always pointing inwards, representing the tension uh, from this, from the string. And so the point is, if, think of how that, what that says about Newton's third law, because this is all one string. Yeah, it has a little piece of plastic in the middle that it just went through, but it's still just one string. So if on this end of the string, this is the part that's swinging around, there's a force in this direction, then which direction would the force be on the part that hangs down on the bottom? Which direction is the force on the black rubber, rubber, bop, rubber stopper then? Remember, this is what it looks like when I'm doing it. Which way would the force, well, well, it's moving around, but if I steadied it, which way would the direction on this, this thing down below now be for the, for the string in the direction that the string is pulling on this rubber stopper? which is down here. Well, if I let go of it, if I get it just right, let's see if I can get it just right. Okay, try again. Oop. Usually if you can get it just right, well, I'm, not, I'm going too fast. You'll notice that when I release that, which way did it go? Watch again. If I go really fast, watch the bobber, this, this, um, this Rubber stopper that's down here. Watch when I let go of it. It just flew straight up. So why do you think that's happening? If I go really fast, it flies upwards. That's indicating that, well, number one, that there's an upward force on this. It wasn't moving upward because my left hand right down here is holding it, providing a downward force, preventing it from going up. But, and they're balanced forces then, right? The string pulling up and my fingers pulling down on the bottom one now. As soon as I let go of it, it flies upwards because the tension in the string on it is upwards. So it's evidence that the, the guy that's hanging below has an upward force from the string. And which way is therefore the string pulling on the thing that's going in the circular path? Always in. And technically it's like this. If I were to straighten the whole rope out, the forces on two ends of a string are always pointing towards each other. It's always true. Even when we did the modified Atwood machine and all of the pulley things, when you have a rope, one side of the string pulls inwards, and it's always an inward toward the center of the rope pull, and the other side is pulling on the other object always towards each other, like this. And you can change the direction of the rope, of course, just like a pulley dud did, so it's not a perfectly straight rope, uh, but the same thing still applies. Um, so the point is, if you get that, since I've already proven to you that there's an upward force from the string down here, and that upward force can actually be more than it weighs, because for this thing that was hanging down here, to go flying up, watch again, it go flying up. Since it goes upward, that means there was more tension on it in the upward direction than it weighed. It, when I released it again, as I swing it around, when I release my bottom hand, if there's more upward force from tension than its weight, then it moves up, which it did. So that means the tension in the string can be more than it weighs. Could I make it so that the tension in the string is exactly equal to what it weighs? So that it doesn't move up, but it just stays in one spot. That's what I was trying to do. It's kind of hard. But what would I have to do? Well, let's think about the swinging end of this. Think about mv squared over r. Remember that the amount of inward force, the tension force, necessary to keep this thing going in a circular path depends on the mass of it, m, depends on its speed that it's moving with in meters per second squared. That's the mv squared, divided by the radius, which goes from here to here. So that inward amount of force can be varied if you vary the radius to being from a long radius to a short radius up on the top part. Or you can keep the radius the same and just vary the speed. Faster speed means they're gonna create more, you're going to create more tension because faster speeds, again, require more inward force, and that inward force is coming from the tension. So as you speed this up in faster, faster speeds, I can really, boom, it flies up in just a fraction of a second. Of course, if I slow it down, I can make it move upwards after letting go more slowly. Of course, if you try to get it just right, you should be able to get it so it just hangs. Now, I can't really do that because it's hard, but in textbooks, this is the textbook problem. That's the one we're going to work on. The problem ends up being, with what speed does this thing have to be rotating around in meters per second so that this thing that's hanging 
just stays in one spot while this thing swings around. It doesn't go up, it's this thing that's hanging. It doesn't go down, which again, if it's too slow, if I'm really swinging this slowly, well, one, it starts to dip and bang my head, but if it's too slow, this should sink, this thing below when I let go of it. Ooh, it's actually staying. There we go, I found it, I got it. So there's a certain speed there. If I go fast, well, if I go, it's harder to go slower than this, to be honest with you. But if I did go much slower than this, let's see, it should start to fall, right? It only doesn't because of the friction on the top with this little piece of plastic. But at least I did show you that there is a certain speed that causes that to hover. Now, some people reference the word, the word centrifugal, centrifugal force, not centripetal force. And AP people don't want you, even college professors don't want you to talk about centrifugal force. I don't know why. The idea is that when something is rotating in a circle, if you've ever been on the amusement park ride, which is the Turkish twist, it's a big thing that spins and everybody stands along the wall. And then as it spins faster and faster, you feel stuck against the wall. And if you move your hand out and then let go of it, boom, it smacks, smacks back. And you feel this outward force against the spinning wall. It's like a spaceship that's spinning around. And you're so stuck against the wall and they're so convinced in the laws of, gra of, of physics that they drop the floor out making everybody scream, thinking they're going to fall, and they know they're not going to because they're spinning around and they're stuck, stuck to the wall because it's spinning. That is an outward force that your body seems to feel. It's called what we would refer to as centrifugal, with an F-U-G-A-L at the end, centrifugal force. I don't mind mentioning that word. Uh, I'll tell you why there's this debate about whether we should talk about centrifugal force and centripetal force with students or just centripetal force. Talk about that debate later. But I will mention that if this thing is swinging outward and you invoke the idea of an outward force, that the swinging that this create the idea of this thing swinging around is creating an outward force. Outward meaning directly away from the center as it swings, then that outward force you'd say, ah, that would definitely be able to lift, right? An outward if I just pull on it outwards, then of course it goes up. So there is a, a centrifugal effect of this thing spinning that pulls outward. Uh, causing this, this whole thing to rise up. And that's the problem I'm going to write up for you now. I'm going to have you try. This was a free response question just a couple years ago. Um, but I had a hard time finding it this morning. So I'm just going to draw it up for you. I'd recommend that you try it and jot it down. Maybe call it a special problem. Anything that makes its way into a free response, I would call a special problem. There's always a chance that it can turn up again. Um, or, or a multiple choice, sometimes it does. So focus. There we go. Uh, and then one more check. Did I hit record? I don't remember if I hit record. I hope I did. I think I did. I am recording. I just haven't presented my screen yet, so I'll do that. All right. So what is the way it usually appear? How does it, this problem usually appear? I'll show you. Usually it's not a person standing swinging it around their head. It could be, but it's usually not. Usually the way it's shown is they show it as, this is not focusing. They show it as a table. Like this. A table that has, well, four legs. And then they have a hole here in the center in this drawing. And then they, they have this, they usually call it a hockey puck. So I'm drawing a little hockey puck in here. And then they show that there's a rope attached to it. And the rope goes through the hole that's in the center of the table, and it goes down. I'll dot it maybe to indicate that it's behind the table there. And then there's, of course, something hanging here. And then they label it M. And then they usually show the dotted line to indicate to the person that's looking at this picture that this thing swings around in a circular path. 
you're not supposed to ask what's causing it to go in a circular path. You're not supposed to ask any of those questions. Because of course, well, it's making the thing going in a circle. They'd say, don't bother about it. For, there's some magical force that's causing this thing to go in a circular path. And it's called, they usually call this a puck. And this is the, called the hanging mass. And the question usually again is about what does this, oh, let me also point out that this is usually called R for the radius, the radius of the circular path. And the question usually revolves around what does the speed what does the rotational speed of this puck have to be? What exactly does it, what exact speed does it have to have so that this, this guy that's hanging doesn't move up, doesn't move down, he just kind of stays perfectly in place. So let me write that up. Um, before I do, I'd actually have you try um, drawing a free body diagram, because that's what they probably would do before they even get to the actual question. I'll let you try it. Draw a free body diagram for each <clears throat> object or mass or however you want to word that. But again, there'll always be dots on the AP exam. There'll always be colored circles like this. And one, you know, one for one and one for the other. Um, if you want, this can be the puck on the left. And this is the I'll just put H dot M for hanging mass on the right. So give it a try. <clears throat> what would the forces look like? I can actually zoom in a little, a little more, I think. Move that. No, too much. So I think my thing is zoomed out. Yeah, that's better. Oh, and, you know, I should, I should have said what I said, you know, uh, I should have written what I said. This would have been a commented on the drawing. It would say, um, um, hanging mass is not moving. I'm sorry that, I mean, I said that, but it would have been, it would have been written there. Because the free body diagrams might look differently if they said the hanging mass is actually moving upwards or if they said the hanging mass is actually going downwards. Well, that would require a change in the forces, which certainly would show itself on the free body diagram. But this is this, usually this problem from the AP is always about it not moving. It's, oh, they're always focused on talking about the hanging mass not going up or down, just staying in place, almost always. All right. So what would these look like? Well, for the guy that's going in a circular path, the vertical forces on him have to still be balanced. He is his horizontal motion around this around this table is certainly changing, right? 
but vertically, his position isn't changing vertically. He's always, this puck is always at the same height of the table. So that means regardless of the fact that it's going in a circle, if it's not going higher or lower, um, then technically the forces need to be in equilibrium. They need to balance out. So I can first reference that there's a normal force from the table. Even when you're sliding on a table, it's still the table's still pushing up on you. Even when you're driving a car, or even while the car is moving, the road's still pushing up at all moments on the tire. Wherever the tire is at any given moment, the pavement directly under in that instantaneous moment is definitely pushing up. It just gets moved over to a new area of the pavement a moment later. So there's always an upward force. And in this case, this would be balanced with its weight. But in this picture, the way I've drawn it with him on the left, with the, and they would, they would have to make a choice when they write this, when they draw the picture. They'll have to pick a position for him. With him on the left of this picture, the tension would have to be pointing to the right. I'd encourage you again to put FT and not just capital T. We're going to start talking about period today. Period is the amount of time it takes for something to go around one circular path, one re revolution. It's called the period, one cycle. Uh, and the symbol for period is actually capital T. So for some people, again, who decide to put capital T for their symbol for tension, and if they have a formula that has tension and period in it, and they're both using capital T's for both of those, that's a bad idea because they're going to start thinking they're the same, and they're going to start doing algebra that's not correct because they think they're the same and they're not the same. I really recommend you always do FT for tension. Now for this other guy, this guy over here that's hanging. I want to point out that the tension in a rope is always the same everywhere in the rope, as long as the weight of the, the, the rope itself is fairly negligible, as long as it's a string. And they always use strings where the weight is pretty negligible. That means however much force is, is pulling on the puck to the right from the rope, if, if it was, I don't know, 20 newtons of force here, then there's 20 newtons of force at all points in that rope. The tension in the rope throughout the whole rope is 20 newtons. At any point you ask, what is the tension here? 20 newtons. If it was 20 newtons, I mean, I don't know what it is. But the point is the same value throughout the whole rope, which means however much force I'm representing down here in terms of how much tension force there is pulling on the puck, I really should be representing that same amount of upward force on, on the hanging guy because it's the same rope, the same tension everywhere. So the tension on him, these should technically be, these technically should be equal. Not to mention it's Newton's third law, and it has to be, right? Newton's third law says that those have to be equal, right? Think about what Newton's third law is saying. If, if the puck pulls on this hanging mass through the rope with a certain amount of force, the puck is technically pulling on this hanging mass using the rope. That, uh, and it provides a certain amount of force to the hanging guy, then the hanging guy must pull in the other direction, which is inward. Remember, he feels an upward force. The hanging guy must pull in the opposite direction, which is inward, um, on this other guy with an equal amount of force. Right? That's Newton's third law. These have to be equal. You might say they're not opposite in direction, but it's only because the rope got turned because of the table. Again, if you straighten this rope out, and, you know, what made it all flat, then that one arrow is straight to the left and one arrow is straight to the right for a flat rope. I know it's not like that, but that's, they are equal and opposite in direction. And this would have to be balanced with his weight. This would be FG. So this would be the full credit. You get full credit on that. That was your free body diagram. Moving on. The question two would be, Derive a formula and let me actually before I do this just point out if there was some comment about this mass actually moving upwards while this swings around, the, the swinging effect actually causes the hanging mass to move up. Of course, if he moves up, that means the radius of this the, the string moving up is going to cause extra string to come out of the hole. That means the radius of that guy's circle is going to get bigger. If there was some reference to him moving up, 
then how would that play out on his diagram, the hanging guy? Just commenting, they could technically mention that. If that were true, then the upward force would have to be greater than his weight because there's an unbalanced force in the upward direction causing him to move up. If they mentioned that his swinging effect was so slow that it wasn't enough to compensate for the hanging guy's weight and the hanging guy actually starts to fall, how would that look on this free body diagram for the hanging guy? Well, then the downward vector would have to be longer and the upward tension would have to be a little shorter, indicating there's an extra downward force that's unbalanced in the downward direction, he's gonna start going down. Of course, if he's just hovering, then there has to be what we call static equilibrium. Static meaning not moving, equilibrium meaning those forces are equal. Now, next one, drive a formula for the speed V of the puck such that the hanging mass doesn't move. Or I can say is in equilibrium. And suspended in the air. Derive a formula for the speed v of the puck such that the hanging mass is in equilibrium and suspended in the air. So first off, before we tackle that, let's come back to our free body diagram and think, well, this is going to be an equation thing, right? Obviously, derive a formula, equations. So let's come back to our free body diagram and make a connection with the equations. What amount of inward force does this guy need in the inward direction? If I drew another picture of him up here, here's the puck. Here was his dotted path. Again, at all points, he needs to feel an inward force. And we call that the centripetal force. If he was on the other side, of course, over here, then the inward force he has to feel is, again, inward towards the center, right? If he's, if he's over here, then it's, then it's inward like this. The inward force is called the centripetal force, and it's necessary to change this guy's direction because his direction is constantly changing. His natural state of motion is just to go off in a straight line at a constant speed. That's Newton's first law. Object in motion should stay in motion in a straight line, moving at a constant speed, unless there's some weird forces going on that change that. Well, there are some weird forces in this case called the centripetal force. And that inward centripetal force will constantly change its motion and keep it in a circular path. What does that centripetal force have to be equal to? In amount. Well, remember that the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. We talked about that before break. I know it's been a little while, but I'm reminding you of that. The centripetal acceleration, which is how rapidly the puck's direction changes, is equal to the speed squared divided by the radius. The radius, of course, is the length of the rope, r squared. And the centripetal force is therefore m times that, right? F equals ma. F equals ma. But if we're talking about centripetal force, then we have to stick the centripetal acceleration in here. So the centripetal force, the necessary amount of inward force that this puck needs to get from the string must be mv equal to the mass of the puck, the speed of the puck squared divided by the length of that radius of that string. Whatever that is at any given moment of swinging, if it comes out as 300 newtons, that means that tension in the rope must be able to, must be that, it must be 300 newtons because the puck requires that amount and the, and the rope is able to provide that inward amount of force without breaking, because maybe the breaking point for the rope is 700 newtons, rope says no problem. Swing me at that speed, I can give you that 300 newtons that you need because mv squared over r for you right now comes out as 300, I got that. Go a little faster, oh, not you know v squared v is gonna go up because you're going a little faster. All right, it's not 300 newtons anymore in terms of the total amount you need, it's 400 newtons. I got that, I can go up to 700 before I break. We're talking about the strength. And it will provide that amount of inward force. What amount? mv squared over r. Whatever m for the masses, whatever v speed of the, of the puck is squared divided by r. Again, the mv squared over r often after 15 years of teaching is very mysterious to students. And I'm sorry, I try my best to explain it. It's, I realized that at, even at the end of the unit, an understanding of what it actually is is, is limited. They're able to make calculations. They're able to do fine. But what, what do, I, do I always end the unit thinking they get it? Um, some, 
some, but it, it seems to elude a lot of a lot of students. Kind of like the normal force it takes a while. Like there's a little mystery about the what the normal force actually is for a while, I think, until students finally get it. Um, again, the centripetal force is a general word like dog. There's lots of dogs in the world that have different names, but you wouldn't use the word dog to describe a specific one. You would use the word Charlie if the dog's name is Charlie. Charlie is a dog, right? What's the more general word out of Charlie and dog? Dog. Charlie is a dog. He falls into the dog category. In a similar way, centripetal force is like dog. It's just a general word, a general category. It references the amount of inward force that this thing needs in order to stay on its circular path. What could it be? It could be gravity. It could be the sun's gravity, as we'll talk about soon. It could be the sun like this, and this could be Earth going around in this circle like this. And you'd realize, oh yeah, the sun's gravity, the sun's force of gravity pulls it in. So I'd say, yep, that's right. So who's, who's providing this? Who's Charlie in this picture? The centripetal force is like dog. Who's Charlie? Who, who is the inward force? Who is that centripetal force? Earth's gravity is. Earth, Earth's gravity is Charlie. In this example, who's Charlie? Well, centripetal force is, again, is just a general word referencing some inward force that's causing this thing to move in a circular path. Who's playing that role? Who's taking that role? The tension is. The tension in the rope is Charlie, right? So I want to really try to communicate that to you, that this concept of centripetal force is just a generalized word uh, that, in, depending on the problem, depending on the physics of a scenario, it could be a variety of different things that provide that. For your problem that was pivot interactive over the brake, the static friction force, or force between the tires and the asphalt that happens to be an inward towards the center of that circular path force. It just happens to work that way. The physics of it makes it so the static friction force is toward the center of the rotary. So who's Charlie in that lab? The static friction force is Charlie in that lab. It's the specific force that is providing the centripetal force for that car in that in that scenario. So again, the centripetal force is a very generalized word. It can be provided by a variety of things. It's always calculated by doing mv squared over r. The amount of centripetal force, the amount necessary, depends on how fast it's moving. It depends on how tight that circle is or how wide that circle is, and that's the r piece. So my point being, who is the centripetal force in this problem? The tension is. Tension is the centripetal force. So that means we can just cross out Fc and say that the tension in magnitude must be equal to mv squared over r. Because the tension is the centripetal force. It is providing the centripetal force. As long as it's not so much that it causes the string to break, it will provide it. Ft is equal to mv squared over r. So that means I can come down to my free body diagram and technically write that in. Equals mv squared over r. They wouldn't, they wouldn't encourage that, but I don't mind it. AP, you don't put any equations on your free body diagrams on the AP exam. But I mean, I think, I think it should be encouraged because it helps students, again, make the connection between why we do these free body diagrams in the first place. Because it helps you do these kinds of hard calculations. It helps you set up the formula. That's the hardest part that students struggle with. Once they have the formula, AP students are great at math. They can manipulate stuff, solve for algebra, you know, do all the other, fine with all that stuff. The hardest part is, where do I start? Like, what, how do I create the formula? Well, this is a great tool for helping you do that. Ft is mv squared over r. Let's look at the other guy. What does the tension have to be for him, this hanging guy? What does the amount of tension force in the upward direction have to be equal to for him? Hmm? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, close. Good. So gravity, which I knew what you meant, but force of gravity, yep. Otherwise known as his weight, right? The weight of this. So, which we have. We have Fg is, is his weight. So the tension force for him, you ask him over a guy that's swinging in a circle, you say, he says, yeah, I got to have a, just this exact amount of tension in the rope for me to stay in this particular circle that you've got me going in right now with this speed that I have and this distance from the center. It's mv squared over r. You say, I'll go talk to the rope. I'll let you know if he can come up with that. Then you go over to the other guy on the other end and say, how much do you need? 
how much do you need the tension to be? He says, I need it to be exactly equal to my weight because I'm the one that's going to be just sitting here hovering suspended in the air. I need, my, I need the tension to be equal to mg. You think, hmm, can the rope make both of them happy? Can, the both, can, can both of them be satisfied at the same moment with their requirements? Can the tension be made so that not only does it give exactly mv squared over r amount of tension to the guy that's going in the circle, so he stays in that circle, but the tension also, that number, whatever mv squared over r comes out as, maybe comes out as 30 newtons, that that 30 newtons is exactly what the other guy needs so that his weight is, is compensated for, or canceled out. That means they have to be equal, right? The amount that he needs has to be equal to the amount that he needs. Because it's the same thing, the tension in the rope that's, that's satisfying it for both of them. They, they both have different needs in terms of their expressions. His has to be equal to weight. His has to be equal to mv squared over r. Now, there's no negotiating his weight. His weight is his weight. The question is, what does V have to be in the mv squared over r? Because m is m. You can't negotiate his m. He's just like, I'm a puck. I have a certain mass. You can't change my mass. The question wasn't, what does the mass of the puck have to be? It could have been, but it wasn't. They said, there's a certain puck sitting there. All right, m is not negotiable. What is negotiable? V. Because the question says, derive a formula for the speed what does the speed of it have to be? You can negotiate that. You can say, hey, we can make that speed faster or slower. What does this V value have to be so that we do that V value, which we don't know what it is yet. We're going to try to solve for that. And we square it, and we multiply it by the puck's mass, and we divide it by R, that that number is exactly equal to his weight. That's what we're doing. We're setting this up so the MV squared over R amount is exactly equal to MG. Right? And that makes sense, again, because they're the same rope. The tension of the rope is the same on both sides, and they're always equal in amount. It's Newton's third law. So mg has to be equal to mv squared over r. mg equals, M and let me be careful here. I should. We got to distinguish our m's. So let's call this m. They would usually call it mp. I mean, what, if you write top, they don't care what, as long as you have something there to indicate. I'll put MP for the mass of the puck so it, that it's clear who's who. So this really should be MP. And I kind of do dove right into that. I didn't have to. I could have just made the statement that the gravity force of the hanging guy, Earth's gravity force pulling him down, has to be equal to the centripetal force. Or I could even just, just skip the word centripetal and say it has to be equal to the tension that the other guy needs it to be, which is MB squared over R. And then you're expressing the tension force as mv squared over r, and his weight is mg. All right, solve for v. You can do that from there. That's what, that's what we were asked to do. Derive a formula for the speed v so that mv squared over r will come out as the hanging guy's weight. Well, solve it algebraically for v. Give that a try. It's going to take a second. While you're trying that, I'm going to try the next, write up the next question to this. In the AP exam free response question that I'm remembering, which is a few years ago, the next question was derive a formula for the period. Capital T, which I haven't talked about much with you, but, but I will now. Derive a formula for the period T such that, and it's the same, same requirement, such that the hanging mass is in equilibrium. So the amount of time, again, that it takes something to go through a cycle in science is called the period. Period of, it depends on rotation, it could be. It could be the period of a, a cycle in an engine. A piston goes 
up and down in an engine, and that's called one cycle or two cycles or two cycle engine, four cycle engine. The, a cycle is always just the amount of time it, it takes to go from one configuration away from that configuration and then return to the same initial configuration. For a pendulum that swings back and forth, you could call the period the amount of time it takes to go from one side when it just kind of stops for a brief moment. That's its initial configuration, if you want to call it that, the side position all the way on the side. And then it swings all the way back to the other side, and then it returns all the way back to its original spot. And then you stop the stopwatch at that moment. You say, what does it say? You say, well, 3.2 seconds to go all the way to one side and all the way back. And you say, well, the period is therefore 3.2 seconds. It was the amount of time required for it to go through one cycle go from some configuration away from that configuration and return back to the same configuration. The time for one cycle, it's called the period, and the symbol again in physics is capital T. Let me remind you of a very useful tool when it comes to this topic. Since the speed is the same, the velocity is not the same, direction is always changing, but the speed is the same. Like when I was whipping it, around, I was trying my best to just kind of keep it at a constant speed. Whatever that speed was, it was staying at that speed round and round as it went around. And therefore, you get to use constant speed motion formula. What is this motion? What, what general formula could you use for constant speed motion? that relates distance to speed and time. Time being how long it's moving for, distance is how long, it, how far it moved in that amount of time, and S represents its speed, or V represents, what formula would we use for constant speed motion? Anybody? Anybody at all? Anybody? Distance divided by time. I like it, I like it, Matt. Speed equals distance divided by time. Who cares about the symbols? Nobody cares. I don't care. It could be whatever, delta x, and nobody cares. Just know that the concept still holds. They'll still give you credit. They don't care about the symbols either. If you know that constant speed motion is calculated by measuring some distance it's traveled, and then timing how long it took to go that distance, and do one divided by the other, then you'll get the speed in whatever the units are. If you measure the distance in miles and time in hours, that'll be in miles per hour. If you measure the distance in meters and time in seconds, it'll be in meters per second. So generally speaking, distance over time is useful for constant speed motion, and this is constant speed. This is, uni this is the topic of uniform circular motion, and that's what actually we started with. When I started the topic, we said, what does uniform mean in uniform circular motion? It means that something has to stay the same. Actually, two things have to stay the same. The distance r has to stay the same as it goes round and round, and the speed s, or v, has to stay the same. That's considered uniform circular motion, and that's what we're talking about. So what is the distance around? What is the distance all the way around a circle? Why don't we reference, because period is the time to go all the way around once. Period is the amount of time it takes to go from here back to here. All right, well, what's the distance all the way around that? What's the distance all the way around a circle? What's the distance around a circle? Anybody at all? My AP, my AP student. Distance around a circle is 2 pi r. It is the circumference, yes, of the circle. And we're, if we're referencing one trip all the way, if the distance all, is all the way around, all the way around once, then we're talking one cycle. And if we're talking around what one full cycle all the way around, one revolution is another word for that, then the time to get all the way around it is, uh, that's called the period. That's what we were actually we were just talking about. So that means this little t, which could be any amount of time, is now capital T. And I know I write in caps. You should know that it's capital T. The symbol for period is capital T. Even though I write in caps, it's capital T. And then you'd say, well, S, yeah, technically in this problem, when we look at, they don't usually have S here, even though they say speed squared divided by R, they actually put the symbol V. I know it's confusing, but just know that V and MV squared over R is just speed. So let's call it V. 
super useful. This is a super useful formula for this topic. V equals two, however long it takes to go, uh, whatever the distance are all the way around is, divided by how long it takes to go around. That'll give you the speed and whatever the units would be for us, meters per second, of course. So you try. Can you technically plug that in? Can you take, technically take that idea and plug it in to V? You could plug it in in this, in this configuration I currently have, or you could have solved it if you solved it for V, which this question had asked, what would you have gotten? You would have had the mass of the of the hanging guy, g, times the radius of the. If I multiply both sides by r, there would be m g. Then r is the length of the string, technically, at least the length, not the full length of the string, but the the length of the string that's out over here. And then I'd have to divide if I'm solving this for v, divide by the mass of the puck. And then I'd have to square root. So this would have been the derived formula. You can check it for yourself if you'd like for what the speed would have to be just to get it just right so that the hanging mass doesn't fall or go up. Where M again references the mass of the hanging guy and MP represents the mass of the puck. Again, R is just the length of that string that's on the table. But once you have this other two pi R over T, you could just plug it in. You could either plug it in straight straight here for a V and say that expression, 2 pi r over t is equal to this mass. Or you could plug V all the way back into the original spot, however you want to do it. The goal is to solve for capital T once you've done that. Let's do the algebra to solve for capital T. Deriving a formula for the period that we could technically use and plug all these other things in and be like, boop, 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 boop. all right, the period needs to be 1.7 seconds. And if you can swing that thing around so that it takes exactly 1.7 seconds to go around once, that hanging guy won't move. If you go, if the time is a little different than 1.7, he's going to move. That's essentially what we're doing. We're solving for that. We're deriving that formula. Give it a try. This is where the algebra can get a little tricky. So make your choices you know, to make your lives easier. If you're deciding where do I stick this 2 pi r over t into my originally derived formula or back up by one step, well, it's up to you. Notice that r is, is stuck in a square root in the derived formula here. So that means if you plug in 2 pi r over t on the left side of your derived formula in for v, you're now going to have an r on the left raised to the one power, an r to the one half on the other side. For some students, they might struggle with that. Um, however, if you backed up one step in the originally derived formula for v and then plugged in the expression 2 pi r over t it, right there for v where it was v squared, students would struggle less with the algebra doing it that way than they struggle with, they'd struggle more with plugging it in to the derived formula. You might not be aware of that because you know you're you're learning all this now. But at some point, you keep doing this stuff, you realize little choices like that can really throw off what algebra is going to need to be done. And some one sometimes the choice makes it harder. Sometimes it makes it easier. Another minute or so, a couple minutes. Then I'm going to ask some conceptual questions about this. And then I'm going to talk about another problem, which I'm actually um, going to talk about gravity, like a like an orbital motion problem. 
because it makes sense. Because once you compare this puck and I take the center hole in the table and say, let's put the sun there and take away the puck and say, let's make that earth. And we say, oh yeah, it's kind of the same. I'm like, yep, it's totally the same. Same, same physics, formulas are almost the same, a little different, but I might as well follow it up with that kind of problem because they're, sim they're sim very similar. So try, try still to figure that uh, last one out. Solving for the, cap the period, the capital T. You might even want to think, hey, am I learning how to read the formula when I'm done? You know, what are the relationships? How is the period related to R in your final formula? R being, again, how long the string is on top of the table. Meaning if it was a shorter amount on the table, if R was tinier, it's a tighter circle, would that mean that you have to have a larger period, more seconds to get around the circle to maintain the hanging mass in the same spot? Or does it mean that you'd have to do less amount of time to get around once the period? Does it have to be less if the R was tinier? And that's the kind of idea of relationships. How is, what's the mathematical relationship between T and R? If you're developing these skills and you are all in the developing stage. Um, once you have a derived formula, you can read it and say, I can pick those relationships out. I might encourage you to try that. Or how is the period related to that mass of the hanging guy, the hanging guy's mass? Are they proportional? Are they directly proportional? Are they inversely proportional? Is there a square or some square root involved in their relationship between period and mass for the hanging guy? Those can be helpful in answering sometimes their conceptual questions, which I'll ask in a moment. And I'm gonna let you try that now. This is the last question. AP style. Um, Usually there's D parts, um, not always, but usually if um, the length of string um, on the table, I guess we're going to call it R. Again, it gets just a, it's just the amount of string that you you have on top of the table here. If the length of string on the table R is shorter, then it originally was, this can become wordy when you do these kinds of problems at the end. They can be lots of words, so bear with it. Uh, if the length of the string on the table R is shorter than it originally was, when uh, in equilibrium, does the speed of the puck have to be slower, the same, greater to maintain equilibrium or the hanging mass. So that's totally AP style. Uh, the ask question is almost always in this format for a free response question. They say, if something does like this changes, uh, what would this other thing have to do to, you know, make it such, make it such and such? Does it have to be more, does it be less? And of course they would say under here, they'd say justify your response. Now, I would, would make you, um, I give you a recommendation, which is consider um, looking at your formula, right? Look at the first derived formula, because to be honest, who really knows? Like, people don't, like, you, you're not gonna just like know, like a question like, oh yeah, it's faster, like, or, and be able to, for a lot of people, this is hard. This is a hard question. This is hard physics. So if you're feeling like that, good. I mean, that means you're in the right place. Um, what I recommend you do is use the tools that we're teaching you. If you've derived a formula, you derived a formula already for V, which was part question B, and you've got a derived formula for V, then look at what the relationship is between V and R. 
is that's what this question is asking. What does V have to do with R changes? Specifically, if R is shorter. And if you can re read those relationships again from a derived formula, you've got a solid chance at answering these questions. That's the go-to method. That's what we do. That's in physics how we read how we read this stuff. Give it a try. So I am going to um, put, put something, a space for you in Google Classroom for you guys to upload this work, give you credit for it. And uh, I think I'll do that more often. I, I realize that I don't do that a lot, and I should, because kids are, a lot of kids are doing the work in class, and they're not really getting credit for it. They're not, it's not going in as an assignment. Sometimes it does, but not always. So I'll make sure that I do that more frequently. Uh, if I'm having you do work, why not? I'll put a spot in there and let you upload it. Um, it doesn't have to be by the end of class. It might be the end of the day or whatever. But at some point, you get a chance to put it in there and get your credit for it. Sorry that it's not always printed out, but you know the stuff that I write like this is, is almost exactly the way you would see it in, a, in an actual problem. I'd like to review a little bit with you, if I could. And then we're going to use the remaining time and hopefully to talk about gravity a little bit. I know I don't have a lot of time left. If I was plugging, if I go back to problem C, I already had derived the formula here for you guys. And nobody's saying, remember, go try to memorize this. Like, there's no way. There's no way you're going to memorize 3 million formulas and all the different permutations of every formula. It's never going to happen. All we want you to do is learn the skills necessary to figure things out on the fly. If you have the right skills, you can do it. So don't sit and try to memorize this. I really don't recommend that. But nonetheless, this was the speed. This was the speed formula. What it would have to be so that the pop that was hanging stayed just so, just perfectly. And I can see there's some relationships here, right? If the hanging mass was a little greater, then I would, if I, again, the hanging bit, the bar that was hanging was a little heavier, a little more massive. I'd have to, that means these are proportional. V and M are proportional with a square root, actually. But more mass that's hanging, I'd have to increase the speed, the swinging speed a little bit to compensate for that. Because the more mass of the hanging one is more of a downward pull, I'd have to swing it around cir the circle faster to kind of give more of an outward centrifugal force to compensate for that. Or if the mass of the puck was heavier, not the hanging mass, but the puck itself was just more massive. Everything else stayed the same. You replaced it with, again with a more massive puck. What would you have to do with V? Well, these, this is an inverse relationship. More mass for the puck means that I can actually decrease the speed of this movement, the movement because more mass, it's actually a momentum, momentum thing, which we haven't covered, but moment more, it gives it more momentum, and that momentum provides more outward pull, not by, by having extra speed, but by having more mass. You can decrease the speed, that's the case. So that's the idea there, and that's how you read them. If I was plugging in the 2 pi r over t, like I had recommended, to see what we get, I would have recommended plugging it into the first one. I'd end up with m, mg, just following along with what I had here, equals, and I had mass of the puck. Now in for v, you got to be willing to just drop it right in. Go for it. Just drop the whole t. 
kit and caboodle right there. This is V. You're literally taking V out and literally putting 2 pi R over T. All divided by R. So when you're doing this, if I kind of move over here, I know I'm running, I'm going to have to do it under here. Just be willing to distribute your square. It's fine. Your square has to hit all pieces, right? It's, the 2 has to be squared. The pi has to be squared. The R has to be squared. The T has to be squared. Everything inside that parenthesis has to be squared. You'd end up with mg equals mass of the puck. And then let's start doing it. Times 4. 2 squared is 4. Times pi squared. Times then R squared in the numerator. Divided by the T has to be squared. Squared, so it'd be divided by t squared. And then you'd say, what do I do with this r? All divided by r, but you can pull that r out, right? This is the same thing as saying it was just one, moving this r as one top, multiplying the whole thing by one over r, right? So r just joins the t in the denominator. Or you could think of it as a complex fraction. The fraction. On the numerator, 2 pi r over t is a fraction, divided by another thing. That's like a complex fraction. That means they have to reciprocate it. You can look at it that way, r over 1. And then you'd have to reciprocate r over 1 to 1 over r. Either way you look at it, it puts r in the denominator, this r that's here. There's already an r, r squared in the numerator. This is, again, all the algebra that the trips could, could trip people up. There's an r squared here in the numerator and another r in the denominator. I'm sorry that that looks like it's part of that. It's not. And so it gets kind of jumbled up. Yeah, it does. That's how it goes. And if we were now being asked to solve for, uh, what were we asked to solve for here? The period, right? That's what this question was. Solve for the period. Look that you recognize you can cancel out your R's. There's two on top. There's one on the bottom. So that means there's just an R left over in the numerator. Are there any other cancellations? It doesn't look that way, just the R's. And now I'd have to try to solve for T, capital T. So it looks like I can multiply both sides by T squared. T squared would cancel out on the right, and I'd end up with it on the left. I'd have T squared times mg equals this whole line. Mass of the puck times 4 times pi squared times R. Then I'd have to divide by mg, where m is the not the mass of the puck, but the hanging mass. Divide both sides by mg. I'd end up with, do it down, I'll do it there. Then I'd end up dividing both sides by mg. So I'd end up with mass of the puck times 4 times pi squared ugh, times r. Yep, yeah, well, that's it. There it is. Divided by m times g. And then I'd, this would have really been a t squared here. So then I would have to finally do a square root. Ugh. Yep. So I would have to square root both sides. I'd say, all right, square root this whole thing. Square root, and then I can cross my square out. For that reason, sometimes people pull the 4 out, because the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of pi squared is pi. So in some textbooks, you'd see the 4 pulled out of the square root, and the pi squared pulled out as just 2 pi, out into the front. Because right? the square root has to hit everything inside there. Again, when it hits the 4, it turns it into a 2, you pull it out. When it hits the pi squared, it turns it into a pi, you pull it out. And what are you left with underneath there? Mass of the puck times r divided by the mass of the hanging guy times v. And that was all a square root around that part. So this is typically the way you might see it written in a textbook. Now we can see if the radius was smaller. Oh, that you weren't asked that, actually. But if you were, what would the period have to do? Actually, we were. That's the last part, right? The last question. If the length of the string was, oh, no, you were asked it about V. But if you were asked it about T, if the radius of the swinging guy was smaller, then the period would have to decrease. You have to move around quicker to make less time to get around. But that is the derived formula right there. All right, and then the last part was for if the length of the string was such and such, smaller, um, then what would have to happen to the speed? If r is less, v would have to be less. 
These are both in the numerator. They're both on opposite sides of the formulator. If R is smaller, again, all the other things stay the same, so that means we're assuming they're constant. If R is a little bit less, then V will have to be a little less. They're not directly proportional because there's a square root there. If the square root wasn't there, then I'd say they're directly proportional to each other. R cuts in half, then V has to cut in half. But there's a square root there. But at least you can conclude less R would cause less V. Right? Lower. I'm not going to give you my justification because I want to see what your justification is. All right. Um, I'd like to, if I can, in my last 10 minutes, show you one other quick thing. Hopefully, if you uh, watch the videos, um, you saw this formula. This is another, another similar, very similar, but different, uh, about universal law of gravitation. Again, I only have 10 minutes, but I'm trying to use it up as best I can. What that means is if you have, let's say, a sun orbit problem, and then you've got Earth going around. This is like the puck going around the center hole. And this is now R. This is the R that we see in the formula here. That if you wanted to know what the gravity force is between the sun and the Earth, and we know gravity pulls all things together with a certain amount of force, but the amount of force that gravity pulls things together with depends on the masses of each. M1 might be the mass of the sun. M2 might be the mass of the Earth. And they're proportional. More mass on either planet, more gravity force. They pull together with a greater force if either of them is more massive. That's why it's, these are in the numerator. And an inverse relationship with R, <clears throat> meaning if the planets are closer, Gravity is strong when two things are close together. Yet when two things get further apart, the gravity force is weak. It's like magnets. Two magnets pull on each other with a lot of force when they're close. And then when you separate them, there's not as much pulling force. It's an inverse square relationship. Inverse, because more distance means less force. Or less distance, when they get closer, means more force. And square, because there's an R squared there, and it takes an Isaac Newton to figure that kind of stuff out. Gravity force between two planets is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. It's called the inverse square relationship, which I'm guessing you might have seen. You probably mentioned in the videos. This whole formula is known as Un Newton's universal law of gravitation, by the way. If I wanted to do a, a problem now with using that, let's just use this as Earth. And let's use um, this as the moon. It doesn't have to be the sun in the middle and the earth. It could be, could be the earth and the moon, but let's just do this, a similar thing. So a homework assignment that I want you to try, I want you to jot this down, is derive a formula for the speed of the moon. In terms of, in terms of um, the orbital radius, so the orbital radius is the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the Moon. That was like the string. It's now just the distance between the Earth and the Moon. We call it the orbital radius. Derive a formula for the speed of the moon. Well, that's like the speed of the puck. It's the same idea. And let me point out, which way is Earth's gravity pulling the moon? Inward, right? This is the gravity force. This is Earth's gravity. It pulls the moon. Oh, how convenient. Towards the center of its circle. Oh, it's, so it's like the rope. Yep, it's totally like the rope. It's like the tension. Right? That's the gravity force. And do we have an equation for the gravity force? We do. We do have an equation for the gravity force. Just like before, um, you know, we said, oh, do we have an equation for the centripetal force? MV yeah, there's equations for everything. You've got to know where to look. I might also, um, so let me finish this and then have you write, jot it down and then add a couple extra questions. And if I can't fit them in, I'll just post it into Google Classroom. Derive a formula for the speed of the moon in terms of the orbital radius. 
and the masses of the earth and moon. And any other fundamental constants. When they say fundamental constants, they just mean constants like, that don't change, like pi or g, lowercase g, like 9.8 is a fundamental constant. This is actually a fundamental constant, capital G. It's called the gravitational constant. It's a constant in nature. It doesn't change. You can look it up, or I can just write it down for you. This is the number for g. It's a it's a 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. It's just a constant number, like pi. It just called the gravitational constant. Um, so when they say that, when they use those words, derive a formula for such as us and any other fundamental constants, they mean, you know, in this case, g would have to be in your formula. And I would ask you lastly, if I have uh, four more minutes, which I do, I think I have enough time to say, um, I want you to, you know, steps that I want you to do, um, or I don't want, let me say derive, create, Create a free body diagram. Because again, they'll always have to do, you know, if you can knock out the free body diagram right away, you've got points there. Then if you're nearing the end and there, or the second question ends up being a formula, formulaic kind of question, and sometimes it is, you can use your free body diagram. And then if the, again, you can use your free body diagram to make the formula stuff. And then if the last question is, uh, hey, if this changes by like this, how much does this change? And you know how to read the formula, you're in good shape. You could probably get a lot of points out of these free response questions, at least the ones that are like this. Create a free body diagram for each, for uh, this, what was it, the Earth and Moon. And it'll be a circle for both. Earth can be this side if you want, and moon could be this side if you want. And the picture would be like, you know, like we had before, Earth. And maybe we'll put the moon on the right side of this image. Kind of like that. It's important for you to see the connection. You know, that's why I wanted to do it in one class with you. Those two things, they're very similar. Um, not really. You think, like, how does a puck have anything to do with Earth and Moon orbit? And that's the cool part about physics. They're, they're not. They're totally different things. But the physics is actually very, very similar. There's a lot of things like that in physics where they appear different, but there's a lot of similarities that they have underlying them. The, the, um, to create a free body diagram and then to work on deriving that formula, to derive a formula for the speed of the Moon in terms of the orbital radius and the masses of the Earth and the Moon. And then the other fundamental constants. That's just the first question I want you to try. I'm going to post it. I will type it up um, in Google Classroom at some point today. And I am going to, oh, I have another minute to say that. I recorded the first 10 questions for the quiz, the um, dynamics quiz. I, I recorded my own answers for the first 10 questions. In a few minutes, I'm going to record the next 10, and I will be posting those. So you guys have all 20, but it'll be in two videos, because again, I did half yesterday, and I'll do half today, so there'll be two videos posted. Um, I will also post this question, and potentially something else for you to look at relating to orbital motion, because I'd like to talk about that more in the next class with you guys. Um, all right. Let me see if I can minimize. Uh, If I don't pin myself. So, all right, guys at home, um, I hope you have a great day. Keep your eye on Google Classroom. If you have any questions, let me know. I'd be happy to help you. I'm, rem I'm reminding you, I'm always available after school. I'm here every day till 2.30. So if you feel like there's something that I'm doing in class that you're not sure about, you feel you know, like you might, might not be able to do it, then just email me. I I'll be happy to do a virtual meeting with you right after school, and I can help you do the, the homework. If there's any point, ever a point where you need that, just let me know. All right, have a great day, everybody. Talk to you, uh, or see you on Wednesday. Or, no, Thursday. Bye, everybody. Have a good day, guys.